Well, this is kind of cool. This is, looks like for the first time this month we're going to be able to start this program on time. <laughs> we got no stragglers! Yay! Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Yankee Air Museum Historic Presentation Night for July, I think it is. I'm Jeff Bush, your host for the night. I want to welcome everybody aboard tonight. How many first timers here tonight? Great, good deal. Of the first timers, how many are members? Whoa, cool. All right. As always, for those in attendance who are not members, this event is free for members, unlike you had paid it in. Um, we do, it's just one of the many benefits you get as a member of the Air Museum. Uh, even though it's free, we do ask our members to pick in a few bucks on the way out the door. We got a box back here on the table, another one just out the side of the door. Um, donation of five dollars allows us to continue these programs uh, month to month uh, and, and bring in interesting speakers from all over the country. As far as upcoming events, our 25th annual Thunder Over Michigan Air Show will be August 12th and 13th. We're all excited about that. The uh, F-22 demo team is going to be here. No big jet teams this year, but we don't need them. We don't need no stinking. <laughs> <laughs> we can make a good air show even without the blues and the Thunderbirds, right? Um, August 24th, you will be able to fly the Ford. It's a fully restored Ford trimotor. will stop at historic Willow Run Airport, allowing you to experience air travel as it was in the golden age of aviation. Also, another popular open cockpit days will occur on August 27th. As always, please check the website, www.yankeeairmuseum.org, and watch for updates and information on upcoming events. And now, I'd like to ask you to turn all your cell phones to stun. <laughs> Tonight, please hold your questions for the end of the program. Before you saw the description of tonight's program, how many would have agreed that the Wright brothers were the first to fly powered heavier than air aircraft? <laughs> However, it would appear that five years before the brothers Wright, a gentleman by the name of Augustus Herring flew a powered aircraft in southwest Michigan. Or so they are adamant about in southwest Michigan. <laughs> Please welcome Mr. Bob Myers, who will shed light on this story. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, my, I'm, my name is Bob Myers. I'm Director of History Programming for the Historical Society of Michigan. Uh, we are based in uh, kind of on the outskirts of Lansing. We're, uh, we're, we are not the State Museum Library Archives. Those are our very good friends. We love them very much, uh, but we're, we're a different organization. We, uh, a lot of people know us best because we publish Michigan History Magazine. We have any Michigan History Magazine subscribers here? Oh, a few of you. Okay, great, great. Uh, we'd love to have uh, more subscribers. So, yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, we but we do uh, conferences and and programs and assistance to uh, member organizations. Yankee Air Museum is one of our great member organizations, and. Uh, so that so we do things like that, but we don't have a we don't have a collection. We don't have a museum. So I just wanted to kind of introduce my organization. Uh, but the program tonight is about uh, Augustus Herring. Uh, there are very few, very very few photographs I've ever been able to find of Herring. This is one here, uh, not exactly the best quality. And uh, the photograph on the right is uh, supposedly uh, Herring flying at Silver Beach in St. Joseph, a powered, air powered aircraft uh, in 1898, October of 1898, a uh, little more than five years before the Wright brothers. The locals in St. Joseph, and I, I lived there for many years, uh, uh, we lived right uh, just a, a walk from Silver Beach. So the locals like to claim that uh, the whole thing about the Wright brothers being the first uh, to fly a powered aircraft was nonsense, that it was Augustus Herring. Um, I'm sure the fact that Augustus Herring flew it in St. Joseph had something to do with their prejudice there. But, uh, but we'll explore that a little bit. Uh, so Augustus Herring, uh, he's not from Michigan or even the Midwest. He was from Covington, Georgia, uh, born there in 1867, just after the end of the uh, the American Civil War. 
Uh, his family was uh, quite well-to-do. They were in the cotton business, and they were quite well-to-do. And so they were able to provide uh, Herring with an education. And uh, he, at age 16, he goes off to college at uh, Hoboken, New Jersey, uh, Stevens Institute of Technology, which is still there, and uh, still, a, uh, still a fine uh, educational organization, still operating. And, uh, but that's uh, uh, Stevens, uh, about the time uh, Herring was there. But you can see the, you know, the building is still there. College just kind of hang on the buildings. And uh, so uh, Herring uh, goes to Stevens to pursue mechanical engineering uh, and does so. He uh, apparently never graduated from Stevens, uh, you know, which was, was not terribly uncommon in the late 19th century. People would go to college and, and get enough of an education and, and they didn't actually graduate. Today it's a little more common to actually uh, graduate. Well, he comes out of Stevens at a time when, when aviation, people are really starting to take a strong interest in aviation and creating some kind of flying machine. Uh, and it's an era of, of new technology. Now, we, we think of today, you know, this is the early 21st century here, everything is changing so fast. We have this leaps in technology. Well, I would argue that the late 19th, early 20th century was even more so. Things that really changed people's lives. Uh, the, the invention of the things, I mean, just staggering things. Uh, the automobile. You could, you could drive around in something that wasn't pulled by horses. And all of this was going from about 1880 to uh, 1920. Uh, but the automobile, the electric light bulb, uh, the, the telephone, you can, you can transmit, boy, the photograph, you can, you can have, you know, we think, well, you know, so what? We got our, our car radios and, and, and recorded music <laughs> and everything. The idea that you could hold on to sound and play it back later. Wow, uh, motion pictures. And so this is all coming, and, and it kind of, uh, there, there's a, a kind of a peak to it uh, with the uh, Columbian Exposition in Chicago, the 1893 World's Fair. You know, it's uh, celebrating uh, the 400th anniversary of Columbus coming to the New World, or quote unquote, discovering the New World, even though it had never been lost. Uh, but, you know, hey, he, he discovered it. Uh, and, oh, and if you're wondering, wait a minute, it's the 1893 World's Fair, what about 1890, you know, 1492, well, yeah, Columbus sails the ocean blue, why didn't they hold it in 1892? Well, they wanted to, but they couldn't get their act together, uh, and so they had to delay it for a year. So the Columbian Exposition, but it, it showcases all of this technology and millions of Americans come to the Columbian Exposition to see this technology uh, in play. And, you know, and there's exhibits from all over the world. It was called the White City on the shores of Lake Michigan. Uh, it was all, uh, these, uh, the, the buildings were all temporary. They were all uh, to be temporary. And they were covered with a, a plaster mixture. They were going to paint it, but they couldn't get their act together and they didn't get it painted. Uh, and then everybody came and said, oh my gosh, it's this beautiful, gleaming white city. But it showcases this technology. And, and people really believed that this is going to, technology, like the airplane, is going to solve all the problems of the world. <laughs> Everything's going to be solved with technology. Didn't quite happen. But one of the things is, of this technology is flying machines. And so Augustus Herring is coming of age at a time, kind of that, that perfect time, when everybody is, is looking at flying machines and other forms of technology, some a little more fanciful than others, as you can see in this uh, uh, print from 1890. Uh, and this is going on all, so people are starting all over the world to experiment with flying machines. Uh, Clement Ader in France, the French were some of the leaders in that uh, he created uh, 
Uh, this was called the Zephyr, and um, claimed that it flew for quite a distance. Uh, most people think that was a vast exaggeration. He might have gotten the thing off the ground. Uh, I, my guess is that he, he did get it to do a little bit of a hop or something. Uh, it is still in existence, by the way, uh, in Paris, in a museum in Paris. They have uh, his uh, uh, avion number three uh, there in Paris. So uh, yeah, he may have actually gotten the thing off the ground for a, a little bit of a hop. Um, and, oh, and this is, this is yeah, kind of based on his stories. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't think it ever did anything anywhere like that. Uh, Hiram Maxim, here in America, inventor of the machine gun. Yeah, the machine gun, uh, which made his fortune. Uh, yeah, there's always a good money in death, and so uh, uh, Hiram Maxim made a fortune in that. And he, like many others, takes some of that fortune. He's, I could, hey, I created a machine gun. I could create a flying machine. And he does so. Um, and it creates uh, this enormous steam-powered machine. And if you, if you look closely, you can see right at the front of it. Uh, I've got an arrow there. Uh, for, to get an idea of the scale of this thing. It was just absolutely enormous. And it's on a launching rail there, so it would, it would run down the rail. Now, he was not totally crazy. And they had a, they rigged up this launching rail with the, the wheels of his flying machine. Um, it was sort of like railroad car wheels, but there was an upper rail as well. So that it could actually rise off the ground, but not too far. Uh, so, you know, the thing wouldn't get out of control. Uh, and so here, oh, and here it is on the, on this launching rail, and, and there's not a good view really of the, that double rail. Uh, but uh, and this is a, at a charity event, 1894. But this enormous flying machine. If anybody can do it, Hiram Maxim could. Uh, here's a steam engine. Uh, actually generated 180 horsepower, so he had plenty of power for this flying machine, and actually a little bit too much power. Uh, because it went down the rail, and it actually lifted off, and it lifted off the, the rail with enough force that it tore apart the upper rail and wrecked the whole machine. Uh, so he did actually get it off the ground, in a way, um, and thank goodness he did have that upper rail to hold it down so that it, it didn't get totally away from him. Um, but, uh, but wrecked the machine, and then uh, uh, Maxim kind of gave it up as a bad job. Uh, many of you have probably heard of Otto Lilienthal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if you were experimenting in the, in the 1890s, if you were looking at, at aviation, developing a, a, a flying <coughs> machine, this was the guy you looked to in Germany. Um, and he was conducting gliding experiments, what we would now call hang gliders, and developed a table of lift uh, for, for wings and so forth. And everybody is looking at him as, he's sort of the aviation god uh, of the early 1890s, early mid-1890s. Uh, he had a hill uh, there that he would fly from and develops a whole series of flying machines like this one. Single uh, monoplanes, biplanes, uh, and his famous quote, to invent an airplane is nothing. To build one is something, but to fly is everything. And so everyone around the world, including the Wrights, are looking uh, to him as sort of their leader. He's, he's got more time in the air by far than anyone else. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, in 1896, he's uh, conducting one of his flying experiments off of that hill and uh, stalled the glider and crashed and, and he was killed. He died a day or two later. And, uh, and that, uh, of course, a uh, great loss and, and shocked people around the world. Well, Augustus Herring is one of those guys that is now taken up with the idea of flying. And he uh, buys or builds a, uh, one of uh, Lilienthal's gliders, 
1896. So this is him there with the uh, gliders. And you can see it's, it's, it's basically a hang glider, what we, what, we would now call a, what we would now call a hang glider. Uh, and he goes into partnership with Octave Chanute. Probably a lot of you are familiar with the, the name of Octave Chanute, another great uh, 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 engineer, aviation enthusiast. He realizes, Chanute realizes he, he's, he's got money and he's uh, there in Chicago. And he, he, so he has money and he has that engineering background like Augustus Herring, but he realizes. Yeah, I'm kind of getting up in years. You know, he's, he's in his early mid 60s by this time, and uh, which is not very old. No. Uh, but, uh, but 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 uh, Chanute says, "Yeah, I'm a little too old for this flying game. Uh, so I will work in the kind of in the background." And so he brings in Augustus Herring, who's much much younger. Uh, to, uh, to actually help him design and build and fly one of these, one of these lighters. And uh, so uh, Herring comes to Chicago. And they go down to, uh, they build these gliders, they go down to Indiana Dunes, uh, which is at the, the southern tip of Lake Michigan. A great area for flying experiments. You have dunes there, kind of like at Kitty Hawk. You have dunes there, you have uh, good prevailing winds out of the northwest, and, uh, and they conduct a whole series of flying experiments uh, at the dunes with various flying machines. Here's, here's one, I think it's very similar to the one in the earlier photograph, uh, with Herring there uh, perched on the hilltop, on the dune top, getting ready to fly down. Um, now these are, they're hang gliders. They have the, the control system is the pilot shifting his weight, just like you would with a with a modern hang glider, and so there's there's no control system other than that, other than, than shifting weight, and what they're looking at is basically how do you get one into the air, and then what do you do with it? Uh, you you've got it flying, and then you control it by shifting your body weight. But what kind of lift can we get out of the wings? What's the best configuration? You know, nobody knows. Monoplane, biplane, triplane. Yep. Nobody really has any idea. Uh, here's uh, Herring again. And I'm not sure where this is taken. Uh, this is probably there in Indiana somewhere, uh, possibly near Chicago. Uh, but he's with one of these uh, one of these hang gliders, and he and Chanute put their heads together, and they design uh, a triplane hang glider. Again, this is all unknown territory, uh, and so you've got a you've got the triplane there with the the three wings, the operator, the pilot hanging down below it, shifting his weight, and then in the back you have a tail, and the tail is there for stability. And what they're playing around with is, okay, how do we control one of these in the air and not run into the same problem that Lowell Enthal had and die? And they're, what they're getting around to is the idea of automatic stability. That once you get into the air, this tail will, uh, will flex or will turn uh, as the glider turns, and it will keep the thing stable in the air so that you won't crash. And that really seems to be what they were, what they were looking at, was kind of automatic stability. Now, you can see there's probably a problem with automatic stability, which is... Yeah, how do you, how do you change direction? How, how do you go anywhere? I mean, you can, yes, you can fly in a straight line, uh, dangling along, but, but how do you go anywhere? And that really doesn't seem to have discouraged them a whole lot. Uh, it was just, how do you get one into the air and keep it there for a while? Uh, they also experiment, uh, this is another one, they take one wing off, basically, 
and uh, work with a, a biplane, but it's mostly trial and error. Uh, you know, working, uh, working with what, you know, take it out, try it out, see how it works, change it from that, maybe what will work a little bit better. Uh, and, uh, and here he is, uh, this is Herring again at Indiana Dunes now with that biplane glider. Uh, gliding down the uh, gliding down the dune surface, and so they're measuring the the distance of the flights and so on and so forth. Uh, they come up with this one. This was called the Katie did. Uh, so you've got sort of a it, it's sort of a box tight arrangement here. Well, uh, Herring and Chanute are two of the leaders now in the late 1890s, uh, mid 1890s. They're two of the leaders in the research on flying machines. Uh, another is uh, Samuel Langley, who was director of the, uh, the Smithsonian Institution, and he hires Herring to help out all with flying machine designs as well. So now he's getting in, Herring is getting into the, into, the big, into the big leagues with this. He's working with Octave Chanute, he's working with uh, Langley. Um, the one thing that seems to be a constant with Augustus Herring is that the only people that liked him were the people that very soon didn't. <laughs> um, and he just had a falling out with, with almost everyone that he worked with. Or I, I guess I would say with pretty much with everyone he worked with. Uh, there, there are varying de descriptions of him uh, that he was, he was pretty arrogant and uh, just hard to get along with, not very scrupulous. Um, so uh, he's working, so he worked with Langley for, for a very, very comparatively short time uh, before they have a falling out too. Langley, as you may know, uh, built uh, what he called the aerodrome. This is a quarter scale model of it. Uh, and again, uh, this was a powered flying machine. Um, and this is Aerodrome in flight. Uh, they launched it off uh, 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 over the Potomac River. And I think it flew, if I remember right, it flew for something like a quarter of a mile, which uh, was greatly encouraging to, uh, uh, to Langley. And so he went ahead and built uh, a full-scale aerodrome, uh, which he launched off a houseboat uh, in, over the uh, Potomac River. Um, and uh, so this is the this is the aerodrome, and he spent uh, for, at that time a, a, an enormous amount of money uh, through the Smithsonian developing uh, the aerodrome and developing the engine for it. Uh, Charles Manley developed this uh, <clears throat> radial engine uh, for the aerodrome. It took him forever to do it, and. Uh, spent, again, an enormous amount of money, but he had the backing of the Smithsonian, and they finally did get the engine projected, and it was really quite good for the time. Uh, about 200, 200 pounds, a little over 200 pounds, and developing 53 and a half horsepower. Uh, but it, it took a lot uh, to develop that engine. Uh, Langley, of course, was getting up in years two. He was not going to fly the aerodrome himself. Charles Manley would do that. Uh, and so they have it ready now in 1903 on the launching track there over the Potomac River. Uh, and it immediately went into the river, it collapsed in the air. Uh, and Manley was lucky enough to get out of it alive. He could very easily have been trapped in the wreckage uh, of this thing and drowned. But, uh, but they did uh, pull him out. Oh, this is the, uh, the aerodrome now collapsing. Uh, this is just about a, a week or so before the Wright brothers' flight down at Kitty Hawk. Uh, but you can see Manley there in the, in the center. That's the engine here. And, uh, and he was just lucky to get out of it. Uh, it's a wonder he wasn't killed. Uh, and they, they pull it out of the uh, uh, Potomac there. Well, um, Herring, in, uh, in 1897, he's, he's had a falling out with Langley. <laughs> Uh, surprise, surprise. And he takes a, he comes to Michigan, uh, St. Joseph, Michigan, right around the bottom of Lake Michigan from Chicago. So he's very familiar with Chicago and St. Joseph. Uh, there are steamship lines that run back and forth all the time. Uh, so he's very familiar with St. Joseph, and he takes a job with the Truscott Boat Company in St. Joseph. 
And Truscott made uh, all these uh, little uh, pleasure launches. They did everything from kind of from rowboats up to small uh, small steamboats. Company stayed in business uh, through World War II. Uh, they're no longer in business. But if you're wondering, well, what do they need an, a mechanical engineer for a, a wooden boat building company? Well, Truscott was unusual because they built everything for their boats themselves. Every little piece. They built the engines, they, not only the boats, but also the engines, which is where um, uh, Herring comes in, uh, is the, the engine design, but they build uh, the engines, all of the brass fittings, even the, the seat cushions they made themselves. So they built every piece of those little boats themselves. They were very high quality. Uh, and so uh, that uh, brings Augustus Herring and his flying uh, passion to St. Joseph, Michigan. He hook up, hooks up with a guy named uh, Matthias Arnott, who was, uh, didn't know really anything about flying, but he was a wealthy banker. And so that gave Augustus Herring uh, now financial backing for developing his, his flying machine. So uh, Arnott is going to, to finance it. He's going to be the money behind the project, so to speak. And Herring will develop this fabulous, wonderful flying machine, and they'll all get rich together. Uh, so they uh, so uh, they built what was called the, they called the, the Herring Arnott glider, um, and Herring made some improvements to it. Uh, Arnott, as far as I can understand, is basically a silent partner in this. He's not he's a science enthusiast, but he's not directly involved with designing the machines and so forth. Uh, but they continue uh, the flying experiments there. Um, and I think this is down at Indiana Dunes again, uh, where they're doing that. And uh, here's Herring now uh, showing off the control system of the glider, uh, which is still weight shifting. There's no move, moving control uh, surfaces at all. And so, uh, again, just shifting weight. Uh, he, Herring at this point feels that He's got it. He's done enough gliding with it. He understands the machine. He understands the glider, and now it's ready for an engine. Uh, and so he develops a compressed air engine instead of gasoline or Hiram Maxim steam-powered engine. Uh, he develops a, a compressed air engine. So it's got a, uh, an air tank with it that's good enough for probably about 30 seconds of. of power time, but it's enough to get this flying machine up into the air. And so here it is now, uh, basically that hang glider, but now you've got an engine attached to it. And he's living there in St. Joseph, working at uh, Truscott Bolt Company, and this is also a pretty good area to fly from. It's, uh, they, there's not really dunes there. Um, like there are at Indiana Dunes or Kitty Hawk, but uh, there is a wide expanse of beach, and some of that was taken up with an amusement park, uh, but there's still a lot of beach there that was still open area. You couldn't run into a tree or anything like that. And so Herring takes his machine down with the compressed air motor, and in October of 1898, um, so this is, this is pre- uh, Langley's uh, a disaster with the aerodrome, but um, but after working with Langley, but uh, so Herring is down there on Silver Beach, and in October of 1898, he claims to have flown on Silver Beach uh, on two different occasions, uh, two different days. Uh, there, there. This is the only photograph uh, known of his flight. Obviously, it's a little hard to tell. Is he in the air or not? Um, there was a newspaper reporter there and wrote a couple of articles about it. And I the, the, according to the uh, paper uh, reporter, he got the thing in the air, that it, it flew along Silver Beach. And I tend to think that that is true. 
that he did get this machine up into the air and it did fly uh, successfully uh, on at least those two occasions there on Silver Beach in St. Joseph. Uh, so, and, and uh, Herring also, he went into kind of the publishing business, uh, published a magazine called uh, The Horseless Age, and um, described this flight uh, from, the, uh, from a few months earlier. Uh, and this is actually the words of the reporter. It was really flying. Already the machine had covered a distance of 50 or 60 feet. And Herring himself said it was about 8, 10 seconds against the wind. Well, unfortunately for Herring, uh, Herring also, he had a lot of luck and most of it was bad. Um, the, uh, in 1899 then, about a, a year or so, uh, a little less than a year after his, his flight on Silver Beach, uh, Truscott Boat Company burned down. They rebuilt, but Herring was out of a job, at least temporarily, with Truscott. And then uh, in 1901, uh, Matthias Arnott, who's financing him, dies at age 33. Uh, so it was uh, certainly an unexpected death. I forget, I forget what he died of. It was a you know, natural death. But there goes his financial. His job is gone, and his financial backing is gone. So he uh, takes uh, to publishing another magazine, Gas Power, that's published uh, in St. Joseph, uh, Michigan. And he's building uh, uh, what he called Mobikes, would be, which would be kind of like a, a moped or something, you know, a, a powered, bicycle, a powered bicycle, essentially. Uh, but he keeps on, his interest in, in aviation history does not wane. And in 1902, he goes, uh, the Wright brothers are gaining notoriety for their flying experiments. Uh, we think sometimes of the Wrights as being very, very secretive. And they really weren't. Uh, they were, uh, you know, Wilbur was delivering papers at uh, scientific conferences on flying and so forth. And, uh, and various people came down to see them and kind of see what was going on there at Kitty Hawk. And so this is um, Herring, um, I think he's uh, third from the, yeah, third from the right there, um, with the Wright brothers and their machine. And he's brought one of his own uh, flying machines down there too, his gliders. Uh, but kind of comparing notes, seeing what's going on. Uh, the Wrights uh, did not trust him much farther than they could throw him, which was probably uh, a, a pretty good assessment, um, but but they 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 did you know were were hospitable to him and so forth to Herring, uh, and they both uh, conducted uh, experiments flying experiments with their respective gliders, their Kitty Hawk, uh, and they didn't really try to hide things from Herring and others, but they didn't really fully you know go out of their way to explain it. And they got the sense that Herring really didn't understand what it was they were doing. Uh, and uh, that they were looking at a, at a control system. And Herring really wasn't that much interested in that. Uh, but here's Herring uh, there at Kitty Hawk, uh, same time as the Wright brothers. And, and, and he's flying his glider there too. But again, no control system. He's got this flexible tail at the back so that it'll automatically shift and provide automatic stability, but no control system other than that. Famously, uh, December 17, 1903, uh, the Wright brothers made four flights there at Kitty Hawk. So, uh, and, and I'll go back to a little bit here. So what the Wrights are looking at is a control system. The engine is sort of an afterthought. They, they uh, got their mechanic, Charlie Taylor, to, um, to build an engine for them. They couldn't get anybody, any engine manufacturer that would uh, build an engine for them that would meet their requirements. So their mechanic, bicycle mechanic, uh, uh, there at the shop, Charlie Taylor, uh, they told him, you know, build an engine for us. And so Charlie Taylor did. And he went down to the hardware store and he got parts. and 
uh, did a cast, uh, cast the engine block, and he built him an engine and put it together in a few weeks, uh, which would have had Langley just spinning in the skivvies, but uh, they did. Uh, so, uh, so Herring immediately, uh, just a, a week or so later, he uh, reads that the Wright brothers have, have succeeded in making a powered flight at Kitty Hawk and immediately tries to shake down the Wrights. And you know, you got, <laughs> he's got gall, and you got to give him that. Uh, but he, said, he writes to them and he says, uh, uh, this, it, it seems more than probable that our, our, wor our, work, <laughs> our work is going to result in interference suits in the patent office. I don't think litigation would benefit either of us. There will be enough money to be made out of it to satisfy all of us. And he wanted, uh, I think it was pretty much an equal share in uh, the right, whatever company the rights came up with because of his enormous contributions to their flying machine. <laughs> and, you know, which he deserves, you know, because he, had, he played such an instrumental part in this, he deserves an equal share. And if they don't quite see it this way, you'll sue them. <laughs> And I'll tie you up in court. So it's a shakedown. Uh, so Wilbur uh, writes to Octave Chanute, um, who of course <laughs> knew Herring, uh, and uh, uh, this time he has surprised us. But that he would have the effrontery to write us such a letter after his other schemes of rascality had failed <laughs> was really a little more than we expected. We shall make no answer at all. And apparently they didn't. Uh, they just. So you just you, you shake your head and you walk away from some of the people like that. Well, Herring doesn't give up. Uh, he's still much enamored of flying. Goes into partnership with Glenn Curtis, uh, another of these uh, rather short-lived partnerships, as things tended to be with him. Um, and they form the, the Herring Curtis Company out in uh, in New York State and build uh, a flying machine. Um, and Herring, er, uh, uh, Curtis and the Wrights, of course, went around uh, for years in lawsuits over uh, uh, Curtis's infringement of their patents. Uh, and Herring has a falling out with Curtis. Surprise, surprise, and he leaves the firm very quickly. This lasted less than a year. Uh, uh, and it becomes the Curtis Airplane Company, which produces the famous Curtis Jenny of, of uh, World War I uh, vintage and then barnstorming in the 1920s, but a, 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 a famous training plane. Well, then he goes into business with a yacht designer, uh, and they build uh, the Flying Fish uh, in 1910 uh, and had formed their own company. And that company went out of, uh, the, the partnership dissolved there too that same year. Uh, and, you know, this is a later airplane by the company, but uh, uh, Herring could not keep any partnerships going. Apparently his, his character, um, he was described also as a rather uncouth uh, sort of fellow. Uh, so he obviously goes one partnership to another and people are getting tired of him pretty quickly. So the question then, uh, as people in St. Joseph like to say, you know, who flew first? This is 1898 down there with Augustus Herring, our hometown boy. And he obviously got a fl powered flying machine into the air uh, in 1898, five years before the Wright brothers, so Kitty Hawk? No, no, not at all. It's Augustus Herring on Silver Beach in our town of St. Joseph. Well, which one is right? Well, I would argue, uh, with my vast experience as an aeronautical engineer, uh, uh, but I would argue that there, there are several criteria that you have to, that you have to meet to have a successful flying machine. And some of you are, how many pilots we got here? Yeah, quite a few. Okay, so see if you guys agree with me. I, I'm a pilot, I had all of about 
I think I got like 220 hours before I had to give it up. But yeah, so fast experience. All right, but here's here's what I would argue as a as a combination historian and, and uh, a very low time pilot. Uh, first of all, it has to be heavier than air, uh, and it has to rise from ground the ground under its own power. So you can have a helium balloon, and the thing will fly. Right? Yeah, it'll go up in the air, but it's it goes up in the air because it's lighter than air. It's because it has helium in it. Uh, so you had uh, helium or hydrogen in, in the case of dirigibles, or you have hot air in a balloon. They'll go up in the air. A dirigible is, is you know, you've got a framework in there, but it's not heavier than air. Uh, so <laughs> it, uh, it, uh, it has to uh, land at a point equal to or greater than the point from which it started. So, you know, you have the movie Thelma and Louise. Well, you can't argue that that car is not flying. <laughs> now, it's not going to rise in the air. It's going down. So it has to, you, you have to, you, you, you can't just shove something off a cliff and say that it's flying. So it, it has to be heavier than air. And it has to land at the same altitude or higher than the point from which it departed. Uh, it has to move forward against the wind. So you, know, you get a tornado, things will fly. Uh, but the, the successful airplane has to move forward against the wind. So yeah, you can get it up in the air and have the wind blow it helter skelter. But I would argue that's really not flying. And, and it may land at a higher point than from which the tornado picked it up. <laughs> but that's, I would say, no, that's, you're, you're still not flying. It's got to be heavier than air. It has to land at a higher point. It has to move forward against the wind. And here's the key one. It has to be controlled. It has to, you, you have to have roll and pitch and yaw, the three axes of control. And this is what the Wrights understood, or came to understand. We need a machine that you can control in the air. The idea, and the idea that you would have automatic stability is a dead end. It's not going to take you any, literally, it won't take you anywhere. You, uh, and, and the idea with the automatic stability was that a flying machine would just be trying to control it pitch and roll, yaw, that's way too complex. Nobody will, no pilot will ever be able to master that. And so we need something that is automatic, that will allow you to fly in the air safely, stable, and land. And the rights say no. That, that's, that's no good. We need something that you can control. And so they develop the full control system, uh, and you know, basically it's, it's what we use today in flying all these years later. Uh, you've got pitch, and you've got roll uh, with, with the ailerons, and then you have, uh, you have yaw, uh, which you can control with, with the rudder. And so that gives you, you can, you can pitch it up and down, you can bank left or right, yeah, and you have you have control, and that's what the rights uh, uh, come up with. With their finally, they are, they're able to perfect that more or less uh, with their 1902 glider. And I, I know back in 19, in uh, 2003, uh, they um, uh, there were various projects of reproducing the 1903 flyer and uh, and the 1902 glider. And from what I read, and some of you may be more familiar than I am with it, uh, but they, they also did a flight simulator with it. And nobody could keep the dang thing in the air. <laughs> and they said, you know, it's an indication of what fabulous pilots Wilbur and Orville really were, that they could actually fly this virtually uncontrollable airplane. But they did. And this is, a this is their 1902 glider. And it's Wilbur making an enormous leap for 
for aviation. Anybody know what he's doing? He's turning. It's a controlled turn. A core, excuse me, a coordinated turn. They fitted the rudder, uh, what we would now call a rudder, to it, uh, and he's got a rudder. Uh, again, what, uh, not their terms, but our terms. He's got a rudder, an uh, elevator, an aileron. He's able to make a controlled turn, a coordinated turn with it, so that it's not skidding in the air. It's a coordinated turn. And that was what they needed. And what nobody else had figured out. So uh, and this is their engine I was telling about. Charlie Taylor developed that. Again, kind of hardware store parts and a cast, uh, casting of the local foundry. Uh, and he builds this little engine that uh, develops 12 horsepower. I think the Wrights asked him for something that would develop 8 horsepower and they actually tested it out. It came out to 12. He did that much better than they figured he would. And, uh, but it's really not until uh, 1905 that, that the Wrights really perfect flying where uh, they're at Dayton on, on uh, Huffman Prairie, uh, where they're, they're able to go up for extended periods of time, flying in, in circles around the, uh, an oval around the, uh, the, the field there, and, and really have a fully controlled practical machine uh, in 1905. And, you know, like I say, today we, we use the same, basically the same control system that the Wrights came up with 120 years ago and which Augustus Herring didn't see, did not understand. So, the question, did Herring fly? Was it the first flight? And I would say, no. That belongs to the Wright brothers. Herring, was it a heavier than air machine? Yes, it was. Uh, did it take off and land at the same altitude? Yeah, I think it probably did, or very close to it right there on the beach in St. Joseph. Did it move forward against the wind? Yeah, move forward against the wind. Um, everything except control. And he did not have a control system. So, sorry to the folks here in Michigan and the folks in St. Joseph, it ain't Augustus Harry. He did not have the first flying machine. So, Harry, um, I, uh, goes on, uh, finally passes away in New York in 1926, uh, and as the obit here says, he was credited with invention solving the problem of maintaining equilibrium in flight automatically, thus adding greatly to the safety of flying. Well, yeah, I guess kind of automatic stability, if that's what he was aiming for, uh, but his contributions are kind of overstated with the with the obituary. Uh, so uh, at at this point, let's see how did I how did I do for time here, Jeff? Well, not too bad. I didn't keep you too awful long. Okay. Uh, so at this point, any questions, comments, or rebuttals? <laughs> Nobody's from St. Joseph here. I know I get into a, there's, there's a guy in St. Joseph I would get into a, probably fisticuffs with. He is absolutely adamant that Augustus Herring beat the Wright brothers. And I just don't think so. Yeah, Jim? Are, were there people in other states similar to Herring in Michigan that would claim to be the first? Yeah, I think there, well, there, there's some around the world, um, yeah, you know, that, that would claim uh, flights. I'm trying to think of some of them. Now, there, there are a bunch of them. What's that? Ask anyone from Brazil, they'll tell you it's Santos Dumont. Santos Dumont, yes. Yeah, yeah, they'll tell you it's Santos Dumont. They deny the Wright brothers even when we're looking at the flyer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Um, yeah, and of course, and of course when, the, when the Wrights, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting story. When the Wrights were, were flying at, at Huffman Prairie, and it was out in public, and still nobody believed they were flying. Um, and even though people saw them up in the air and said, yeah, they're, they're flying an airplane around, but generally around the world, nobody believed it. And the, the reason being that 
if uh, people said, well, you know, if somebody was actually doing what the Wright brothers are claiming that they're doing, of going up and flying around in the air and flying in circles, everybody would know about it. It would be in all the papers. And it's not in the papers. Uh, and so when, when, uh, <coughs> pardon me, when they go over to France in, uh, oh, it was 1908, I think, uh, they blew everybody's minds because, you know, everybody, you know, we're pretty advanced over here. <laughs> and these, oh my God, they're, they're just, fl they're flying. <laughs> they're not doing little hops. They're flying all around in, in circles and figure eights and so forth. Uh, so, yeah, but, but yeah, to go back to the original point, yeah, there were, there's a bunch of, uh, uh, and I can't even think of all of them offhand, but a, a bunch of claimants to it, and I, I would disagree with all of them. Yeah. Did you talk a, a bit about Langley's patent? Didn't he have the first patent for your point? Yeah, he did. Langley patented it. In fact, his, um, uh, of course, Langley, again, uh, the, the head of the Smithsonian Institution, and for years, uh, the Langley Aerodrome, uh, they, they fished it out of the water, and it was, um, later on it was rebuilt, and it actually did fly successfully um, with considerable modification uh, that made it feasible to fly the thing successfully. But it was in the Smithsonian for years on exhibit as the first successful flying machine. And that did not sit well with, uh, with the Wrights. Uh, and uh, so for, for a long time, their, their machine was not in the Smithsonian, but they finally received the, the acknowledgement that their machine was the first. Um, but, yeah. It, uh, long after Langley was no longer associated. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> long after Langley was gone. <laughs> then, but, uh, yeah. What did uh, Herring do other than put a tail on it that supposedly... Augmented this automatic. Was, I mean, you didn't talk about uh, uh, dihedral or anything that we we know works today. Is it just magic or what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they did they did have a certain amount of dihedral to it. Uh, I mean, they they were getting a grasp of of lift, uh, of how you generate lift from stationary wings. You know, they're not they're not trying to do ornithopters or anything like that. But it's, it's, it's mostly trial and error. One of the other geniuses of the Wright brothers was that they developed a wind tunnel. And instead of building a flying machine and going out and seeing how it does, they build a wind tunnel and they test out airfoils. And they realize, you know, we can test dozens of airfoils in our wind tunnel and see how they do, how much lift each one generates in a tiny fraction of the expense and time that it would take to build an actual machine and try it out. And so they have this, this uh, they're making strides with this wind tunnel. Yeah. I think they found that due to that wind tunnel, a lot of the previous calculations on lift by Lillenthal or somebody, I forgot who it was. Yeah, it was Lillenthal, yeah. It was wrong, or at least some major improvements with yeah. The shape of it due to their wind tunnel and they actually hooked up like a chicken scale or something to it so they could measure the, the lift of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're exactly right. They uh Lilienthal had developed tables of lift. So, you know, just you know, kind of like a math book where you've got, you know, ta uh, you know, calculus tables or whatever. He had developed uh, lift tables. And everybody around the world accepted that was a gospel. And the Wrights uh, began to suspect that, from their own work, that it, he wasn't correct, which was like questioning the Bible. <laughs> but they developed the wind tunnel, they're testing out airfoils, and they find out, yeah, he, is, he was right, uh, Lilienthal it, it was correct with some of it, but he was way off with other, uh, other tables. Uh, so his tables of lift were, were badly in error in, in some areas. And so the Wrights then, uh, they build their, their 1902 glider and 1903 machine uh, using the experiments that they've done with the wind tunnel. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it seems like the, the pioneers that actually tested these 
um, planes and prototypes was kind of a dangerous and and not much longevity in life. I mean, one of the Wright brothers was killed early on. Or, well, crashed badly, yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, my question is. Um, was Herring ever injured in any of these things? No, I mean, the, the, the question is, was Herring ever injured? Uh, and, and no, he, he, from what I can gather, he, he, was, he was never injured, or at least not seriously. Um, but you're right, it, you know, it was, it was a dangerous game. I've been doing a, a lot. In fact, I came down and did a program here a couple of years ago on, on Harriet Quimby, who was the first woman pilot. And, um, and she, was, she lasted about a year before she was killed. And um, uh, or she was the first licensed woman pilot in America. Let me backtrack that, correct it a little bit. Uh, but you know, I'm looking at the the flying shows that she was uh, flying at, and just you go down the list, and these people either died or they got out of it. Yeah. So Herring must have had a, a, a Teflon soul. <laughs> <laughs> he is probably just too ornery to die. Yeah. <laughs> but, or, or lucky. <laughs> yeah. I read an article the other day that it made sense, of course, but it pointed out that the Wright brothers didn't have an education, they didn't have a financial backer, and they didn't even have a pilot's license. And they could fly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, they're, the Wrights' formal schooling, they, they never went to college. Um, they had no formal schooling. I think they were just freaking geniuses. Uh, and sometimes you have to factor genius into that. Uh, it was also a lot of hard work. Um, and, and they never, their intent actually was not to, they did not want to start a company. Uh, to build flying machines. What they wanted was to, to make enough money off of their flying machines somehow or other, and they had to figure that out. But to, to kind of give them a life of leisure so they could devote their lives to science. And, and they didn't have to worry about day-to-day -day business of running a bicycle shop or an airplane company. Yeah, great. Um, the, uh, the rights would their original flyer, didn't they use kind of like a wing warping system? And did, did they eventually develop the ailerons? No, uh, they, they uh, it's a great question, Greg. Uh, they, the Wrights uh, used wing warping, which was pretty common uh, for quite a while, really. Uh, the, the famous Blario uh, 11, which was by far and away the most successful pre-World War I airplane, uh, used wing warping, and so instead of having a, the, the aileron, the, the, the little wing the, the, uh, that uh, is, a, is a movable, um, kind of free-moving control surface that you can control, they just bent the wing down a little bit. And they were adamant that that was really what you needed. Um, uh, and, that, and, and one of the ways Glenn Curtis was trying to get around that patent was with the aileron, and saying that this is very different than wing warping. Uh, and the courts finally said, not nah, uh, but, uh, but they're trying to get around that. But they, yeah, they stuck with, with wing warping for a long time. And it was really others that developed the aileron. But yeah, the idea was still the same. You're uh, changing the, the airflow of the wing. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna do just a quick commercial announcement here for uh, Historical <laughs> Society of Michigan. Um, we, as I said, we publish Michigan History Magazine. I've got uh, I brought some some back issues here from a couple of years ago, but I thought the topic was good, and uh, and the history doesn't change. So, yeah, please feel free to take a magazine. Um, but we, uh, we publish Michigan History, that's bi-monthly, and Chronicle is our members' magazine. That comes out quarterly. Uh, great magazines. I have very little to do with them, which is why they're great magazines. <laughs> but we have a very good editorial staff uh, that uh, puts those together. And uh, I've got some little orange coupons up here for $5 off a subscription. So uh, a subscription is ordinarily $24.95 to Michigan History Magazine, but you get $5 off. 
There's a coupon code. You go online. Uh, when it asks for the coupon code, you put in Bob. <laughs> it's on the coupon. And they'll give you, you get $5 off. If you're a member of Historical Society of Michigan, you get both magazines plus lots of other great benefits and, uh, and a free set of steak knives. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but there are great benefits in both magazines. Membership is $39.95, but you get $5 off of that. So $34.95, and you get both magazines. The reason being that our staff says, Bob, if anybody sits through one of your programs, they deserve to get five bucks off of something. So, uh, so I, I, they're, they're very cruel, our staff. Um, uh, we have a weekly History Hounds lecture series. This is a Zoom series, uh, so it's every week. In fact, there was one tonight that I'm missing, uh, uh, but it's Wednesday, alternate Wednesdays at 7 p.m. and alternate Tuesdays at noon. And so you just you you uh, register on our website. We'll automatically you can register for I think six programs at a time, and then every week we just automatically email you the Zoom code. And so there's no obligation. Now, History Hounds um, ordinarily would cost you, we, we nick you $7 for each one. But if you're a member of the Yankee Air Museum, which is one of our member organizations, you can attend free. So you, when you register, you just put in Yankee Air Museum as your member organization, and it's absolutely free. So uh, that's our bit of gratitude for Yankee Air Museum for maintaining their their membership and you know we get to have you guys join us at least on the the computer screen uh, for watching history hounds and again you just go on register put in Yankee Air Museum you do not need to be a member individually of Historical Society of Michigan although we'd love to have you as a member uh, but uh, but there's no obligation just putting Yankee Air Museum as your member organization you can attend any one of them you want free and support the Yankee Air Museum. Um, this is one of, the, one of the gems of Michigan. I mean that very seriously. It's a fabulous organization um, and they do so much for us and in, in Michigan in preserving the history, keeping some of these airplanes flying, uh, the wonderful exhibits they've got out there. They bring in people from probably all over the country, all over the world, I imagine. Uh, to see this museum. And so I would encourage you to uh, uh, join the Historical Society of Michigan, but if you're not a member of the Yankee Air Museum, join the Yankee Air Museum. Uh, and, the, and then you can attend History Hall. It's free too. Uh, but uh, but they, you know, they, our, our museums need our support. And so uh, do consider a membership in Yankee Air Museum. Give them all of the money in all of your pockets, I don't know, whatever. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, throw a couple bucks in the donation box, make a gift shop purchase, something like that. It's an organization that is well worth supporting. So thank you all for coming out on a kind of a crummy night tonight. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming to the program. And again, uh, we'd love to have you as a member or, and or subscriber. Thanks. Just kind of following up on what he was talking about becoming a member of Yankee Air Museum, we currently have a 20% off sale going on right now. <laughs> the, uh, an individual membership is normally $65. 20% off, 13 off. $10 a month to come here. It doesn't take many months before that the, the membership pays for itself. Because members don't pay. <laughs> so, Bob, thanks so much. Thank you. Another great Thank you. program. Uh, we have programs like this first month, uh, Wednesday of every month, except this one. <laughs> uh, next month, August 2nd, our very own Dave Steiner will present a program about his uncle Bill Behrens, who flew 104 combat missions in P-38s during the China-Burma-India campaign with the 459th Fighter Squadron. Uh, he was to have presented this program, I think it was February, and unfortunately some solid sunshine in the form of snow kept everybody away. So we had to reschedule, and uh, so uh, Dave will be here in August. Uh, September's program is kind of cool, kind of special, so 
Pencil in, save the date, September 6th, and that's all I'm going to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> Please remember that the donation boxes at the side of the room and out in the hall are hungry. Your support does go a long way to bring these programs to you every month. Thank you, Becca, again, for putting on another phenomenal program. Uh, great job. And uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. And until next time, bye-bye and bye-bye. See you. <laughs>